since it is um, just about um, 7.30, I'm going to just hang on here one second. There we go. And no one's coming in. So just to, it's just about 7.30 before John takes over. So I just um, like to remind everyone um, that when the meeting starts in a moment to mute their mic and turn off their camera. Um, John um, will start. If you have a question, you can put it into the, the chat. Um, you can also put your hand up and um, I'll be monitoring. Chris and I will be monitoring the questions in the background and uh, we will interrupt at an appropriate time to have those questions answered. So um, I guess, John, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you tonight to get started. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sue. And again, a, a big thank you to uh, Sue and Doug and Chris, who are doing all of the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, Sue, once again, is, uh, is, is masterminding our, our, all, all of this technology for us. And it's, it's very, very much appreciated. What the rest of you don't get to see is all of the work that these people do prior to this, uh, practice meetings, working with videos, uh, all of that kind of stuff to get uh, to, to get ready to do something like to do something like this tonight. So uh, uh, so uh, thank you very much to all of you. A reminder to everyone uh, that we are recording this, and a reminder to everyone that we are live streaming this on YouTube right now. And as as um, uh, as Sue said. If everybody can uh, mute their microphones and turn off their cameras, uh, that will be uh, wonderfully beneficial for the speakers who are uh, who, who have their presentations prepared tonight. Uh, so, uh, so that said, uh, uh, we'll begin. Uh, we have three presentations ready for you uh, this evening. Um, uh, it's been uh, wonderful uh, to. Um, uh, to get out. We've had some clear skies. It's been nice. I know many of you have been out uh, looking at the comet. I've been out a couple of times looking at, at comet uh, Neowise. I'll, I'll just pretend that I can see all of you right now. How many of you have, have seen the comet? Excellent. That's great. Um, uh, uh, you know, alarm goes off at three in the morning. Uh, I'm out at the Mountain Brow by 4 a.m. Uh, looking for the comet. Uh, there's hardly a car on the road uh, at that hour. But what amazed me uh, was how many people were walking along the mountain brow in the dark of the night. Uh, but uh, of course, this is a big city. Uh, so that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. I greeted and spoke to several people there in, in the dark on the couple of nights that I, that I was out there. Uh, being a big city, I was cursing the light pollution uh, and the haze and thinking to myself how nice it would be uh, to have this low horizon and a dark country observing site. And that thought uh, took me back in my mind to a night of observing some 30 years ago. And I thought I would tell you uh, the this, this story uh, about that night. That's right, it's story time. Uh, so we're not at our usual meeting spot all together in the same room. Uh, so I can't actually uh, see you rolling your eyes at the prospect of one of my stories. So instead, I will just assume uh, that your eyes lit up, that there's a smile beaming from your face, and that you just thought to yourself, ooh, a story, and there's nothing you're going to do to change my mind. That's what I'm imagining right now. Uh, so before the days of, of this club, uh, I was at this small observatory and I had just finished giving a uh, group of Boy Scout Cubs a uh, tour of the night sky and a look through the telescope. And they left and all went home. And uh, I was all alone at this country locale. Uh, and uh, I packed up, I uh, locked the doors, I had the scope away, all that kind of stuff. And I went to start the car and nothing, absolutely nothing. The car was a goner, dead as a doornail. So I uh, unlock a front door and I go back inside to call for some help, get a little roadside assistance up there. And I discovered that my car was not the only thing not working that night. No dial tone. Uh, 
this, of course, is the days before cells and mobiles, before internet and texting. You called on a landline uh, by turning the dial. Uh, okay, sure, at that point, push buttons were, 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 were common, but uh, this is a country phone and we still had a rotary dial. So that was it. You dialed for help or you started walking. And since there was no dial tone and I couldn't call, I started walking. Uh, I headed next door to this country farmhouse. And that meant walking a ways down this country road and up this long drive to this farmhouse. It's late, it's dark, and I'm basically in the middle of nowhere, but I was in luck because as I approached the house, all right, I can see in their front window, last thing they expected somebody looking in their front window like this, uh, but as I approach the house, I can see in the front window and there they are, they're home, they're watching TV. Wonderful, I am in luck, right? Knock, knock, knock on the door. All I had to do was await my rescue, but, Instead of my knock knock being answered by the occupants, my rescuers, instead my knock knock is answered by bark bark. Bark bark coming from around behind the house. The barking continues, the knocking becomes more frantic as the barking gets closer and closer. And in a few seconds, around the corner of the house comes this big German shepherd coming at me full bore. All right. Uh, now, you're out at this country house, you need a country dog to protect the property from whatever intruder was threatening his home, and at that moment, the intruder was me. Uh, so, still no answer at the door. Uh, this dog is coming at me full bore, uh, full speed and full volume, and uh, I had uh, no doubt that this dog uh, outside at night in the country was very capable of doing exactly what this dog was supposed to do, uh, which at that moment was tear me limb from limb. Uh, all I uh, could do was uh, stand there on the doorstep. I know enough not to run, stand there on the doorstep and think to myself, oh boy, uh, I'm imagining these nice people uh, opening the door in the morning, coming out to their doorstep and finding what's left to me of me. Uh, on the doorstep uh, beneath uh, a very satisfied dog. Obviously I survived and without a scratch, upon racing right up to me at full speed, the dog turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful pet, wanting nothing more than attention and pats, which I gave him lots of. The owners finally did answer the door. Um, you know, makes it sound like a long time, but uh, it really wasn't, it all happened really, really fast. And me and their dog were there on the front step, already the best of friends. Uh, yes, I used their phone. Yes, I got home okay. And yes, the dog would frequently leave their property, go through the woods, and visit the observatory next door, where it became well known to many of the observers there. I did not get his name that night. I have no doubt you can all guess what name we gave the dog. Of course, everybody there called him Sirius. Uh, I will tell you though, it was not the last time that that dog scared me, even knowing there was a chance of a visit. Um, you know, you're there, you're alone, or maybe you're with one or two other observers at a telescope, concentrating in the quiet of the country, in the pitch dark, and suddenly in the dark, something brushes against your leg, that'll make you jump in the night, even if it does turn out to be your friend, the dog from next door. So thinking back to a night like that, uh, maybe a few morning walkers along the escarpment brow isn't such a bad thing, you know, while I'm out comet hunting. So there you go, that's my story for today. So fortunately, uh, we have other, uh, uh, other presentations lined up for you today that are gonna be uh, 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 much more entertaining than that. Before we get to them, uh, I just have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, one, I'd like to uh, uh, thank, uh, 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 two of our members, Jim and Verna Rose, who donated uh, some uh, books to the library. When the library is back up and running, uh, it'll be nice to get those and the others back out into, uh, into the members' hands. Uh, so thank you very much, Jim and Verna, for your generous donation. Uh, a reminder uh, that it is summer and calendar submissions are more than welcome at this point. Uh, this week, we'll send out an email with details about, uh, about uh, and, and guidelines on how to submit a photo to the calendar. Uh, but it's time. Uh, go through what you've got, find your best images, and send them in. 
so that uh, we can get together a, a, a wonderful calendar for, for 2021. I have no doubt that we will see many wonderful comment images uh, submitted to, uh, to the calendar. I hope so. So keep an eye out for email coming out with the guidelines uh, for your calendar submission. Uh, I hope you all got the message uh, that we are now welcome to return to Binbrook for observing. The email that was sent out has a variety of details in it. Keep an eye out once these summer storms have passed and we get a clear night. Keep an eye out for an opportunity to head up to Benbrook. We are restricted as per provincial regulations right now and how many we can have at Benbrook at one time, but we are, be, are going to be able to go back and I'm sure all of us are very much looking forward to that. And with that said, I am ready to hand over the meeting to some of our presenters. Uh, our first presenter this evening is Ann T. Catch. Uh, Anne is one of the founders of the club. She's past chair. She has served on council and I believe continuously since day one of this club. Um, uh, she is an expert observer and she and her husband Bill, also an active member of the club, are to, going to take advantage of this wonderful new format that we are using to do something that we couldn't normally do in the meeting room. They're going to take us on a behind the scenes look of their private observatory. I'm happy to hand it over to you, Anne. Thank you, John. Hold on. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're having a thunderstorm here right now, which makes me very glad that instead of having a live tour of the observatory, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation instead. Bill and I have had our home-built backyard uh, observatory since 2005. And uh, before that, we struggled for years with the decision to build an observatory because it would have to go in our horizon obstructed light polluted backyard. And that seemed like the worst place to put an ast astronomy observatory. This is a recent photo of the sky shed and you can see the trees all around us, the townhouses right beside it with their floodlights. And clearly it's not the best place to have an observatory. Anyways, after Alex was born, uh, the convenience of having the telescope already set up and aligned and ready to go was just too much to resist. And um, about that time, hold on a second here. I'll get this figured out yet. About that time, uh, Wayne Parker from Sky Shed, he's the owner of Sky Shed. He's also a member of Glass Tiger. He brought one of his garden shed style roll off roof observatories to Starfest. And we fell in love with the design, but none of the sheds he offered would fit our very long refractor and, and tall mount. So we bought the plans and uh, we adapted them to our own telescope in our own backyard. In Hamilton, you can't have an outbuilding more than a hundred square feet. So with that in mind, uh, when we designed the uh, uh, observatory, um, we made sure that it fit all of the parameters that we needed it to. Our Lucky Penny Observatory is 10 feet by 10 feet square and the walls are over six feet tall. Uh, we named it Lucky Penny because when we were starting to uh, dig the ground to level it and make the hole for the pier, we found a penny. The floor is constructed of pressure treated, pressure -treated uh, decking and um, it rests on concrete blocks. You would have seen them in a previous slide. Um, what else can I tell? Oh, the framing, the framing is just standard two by four spruce. Here's a picture of it all framed up. And we wrapped the framing in uh, tie par and Alex helped us. Now the roof is made of corrugated steel siding and it rolls along easily on garage door rails and wheels. It's a good thing because the roof is pretty heavy. 
And we have actually had a very Canadian solution to the uh, to stopping the roof from rolling right off of the supports. It's, we have hockey pucks there. Now I have um, a couple of opening and closing videos that I'm going to play. The videos don't have sound, so don't be worried. There's nothing wrong with your audio. Okay, we have, Bill is unlatching the roof. We have latches to keep it closed when it's not in use because we found with a strong wind, it could actually blow the roof open. Pretty easy to open. All done by hand. And here we are closing it up again. There we are. Pretty easy. Now, in addition to buying the sky shed plans, we also bought their jacks for the pillars that support the roof when it's open, as well as a custom pier for our telescope. The pillars for the roof are not fixed to the ground. They rest on blocks and the jacks allow us to adjust the height. This design allows the roof supports to float and prevents the roof from binding if the wood warps, and it does occasionally. In the 15 years we've had the shed, we've never had a problem with the roof supports and the overall maintenance on the shed has been what you would expect of just an ordinary garden shed, except this spring. When we rolled the roof off in March of this year, it jammed halfway open and we had a hard time getting it closed again. We discovered that one of the wooden beams that supports one of the roof rails had rotted through and the only thing that kept the roof from crashing to the ground was the metal garage door rail. We were lucky. We replaced the beam with a new pressure treated four by four and we have plans to do the same with the beam that separates the two rails. Right now it's just being uh, braced with a two by four. Telescope is a seven inch F9 refractor with its dew shield extended and a camera attached to the back. It's almost six feet long. It weighs about 60 pounds and you can see there are quite a few counterweights on it. Um, there's a picture of looking down the front lens of the camera. Uh, it's a, a Starfire refractor by Astrophysics and the mount is also by Astrophysics. Bill just got a new um, CCD camera that he's trying out. We're hoping it works out and we might actually get some ca uh, calendar worthy pictures this year. Now the pier that we got from uh, Skyshed folks, um, we needed a tall pier to keep the telescope from hitting the floor when it's pointed at the zenith, because the telescope is so long, you have to make sure you keep it up high. As it is now, if you wanna look through an eyepiece at something near the zenith, you have to sit on the floor. The steel pier is full of uh, sand to tamp vibrations, and it's bolted to a concrete footing that goes four feet into the ground, separated from the floor by about an inch of space, and we found we had to stuff um, steel wool into that space. Otherwise we had mice coming in all the time. And over the years, in addition to the mice, we've also had various wasp nests, rabbits and skunks. Um, it's a constant battle to keep the skunks from digging under the shed. I'd say that's probably our, our biggest task right now. 
Here's a shot of Bill sitting at the command center. The German equatorial mount for the scope is controlled by computer. I have a video of the scope slewing and returning back to its parked position. And this time there is sound, um, but I'm going to ask you to just totally ignore the neighbors at the end, the very noisy neighbors. And here we are. Go. This is a fisheye view of the, the sky from inside the shed. And it's very, uh, uh, a very good way to show how the horizon is obstructed for us. We've learned to keep the linden tree in our yard, this is it here, polar aligned so that we can see Polaris if we ever need to tweak the polar aligning on the mount. The neighbor's lights are a source of irritation, but we've learned to live with that. The sky is obstructed on all sides except the east, which would be here, of course, overhead, a little bit of southwest and a little bit of northwest there. Um, but the convenience of stepping outside and opening a door to the universe has been worth it. Um, we have no regrets, and we'd have to say that the backyard observatory has been the best astronomy accessory we ever bought. And I have a few of Bill's astrophotos that I'm going to show. The picture of the sun shot in hydrogen alpha. This was shot with a dedicated solar scope that rides piggyback on top of our main refractor. This of course is the Dumbbell Nebula that was shot through the refractor. The galaxy M109 and uh, Sombrero Galaxy 104. NGC 891 and uh, Galaxy Cluster Avel 2065. And for more information, you can go to SkyShed's website. They still sell kits and plans and everything. And Astrophysics as well has a website that uh, you can check out if you have any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. Well, thank Yay. you. That is, that is absolutely awesome. I'm sure that, uh, that uh, uh, people will have uh, questions and will be very, will be very in, intrigued. I don't know if you all can hear that. Yeah, we could. <laughs> yeah. The thunder. Yeah. So that's absolutely fantastic. How long have you had that scope? We have had the telescope since just before the, just before the club started. So 1993, I guess, it's an oldie, mm -hmm. it's an oldie. So yeah, and, and, uh, uh, and, and absolutely marvelous. I have no doubt it gives uh, spectacular views and yes. those images were amazing. So, so bravo and, and, mm -hmm. and well done. That's fantastic. Any uh, shift in the pier over all of these years? No, actually there hasn't been. And I, I have never noticed anything wrong with the uh, polar alignment. I think Bill did tweak it a few years ago, but um, it's rock solid. And the telescope does move a little bit if there's a strong gusty wind. But other than that, there are no vibrations. There is nothing, it's, it's very solid. Doug, I see that you've got your video on. Do you want to ask a question? Thank you. 
If if there are any questions, I don't see any in the chat. If anyone okay. does have a question for Anne, you can either put your hand up or you can turn on your mic and your video and ask Anne a question. We'll give people a minute. I saw that Andrew wanted to know if we used any filters and the yes. answer is actually no, we don't. Um, we have uh, gotten a, a few that we would like to try, but most of the time we just don't bother. And you think, you know, they would certainly be a benefit, um, but with the, the way you can process astrophotos now, it just hasn't been an issue. Mm -hmm. I also live inner city. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know whereabouts your location is, uh, but um, at best, I would say um, um, I would get maybe a level five um, in terms of uh, darkness. So um, yeah, it's a it's a tough challenge at inner city. Well, we're we're up on the mountain, and we're not very far from Lime Ridge Mall. And you um, saw the townhouses. Uh, yeah, and you saw that the the townhouses are right behind us. And they have a habit of throwing those floodlights on at random times, anytime during the night, anytime their dog has to go out and relieve itself. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. They don't care what you're doing. They just throw the lights on and uh, we just, we just shrug it and carry on. There's not much you can do. It is a terrible location, but it was the only one we had. So well, those are great photos. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's see. Oh, Chris and Denise are getting bad ideas. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> You're gonna have to build your own observatory. <laughs> Anyone else, any questions? And I don't see any hands up from okay. my Excellent. end. Oh, Denise and Chris. All I was gonna say is we do have a a cement pad already from uh, the loss of a garage three years ago, and so you know, the you're halfway there. <laughs> the cement pad's already built. Yeah, you just gotta you just gotta chip out a, a hole in it so you can put the pier in. Uh, that's what jackhammers are for. <laughs> okay, and there is a question mm -hmm. um, from Doug Curry. What yep. measures do you do to counter the light pollution? Not much, Doug. Uh, <laughs> we try and uh, use the shed when we know the neighbors aren't going to be around. Um, that usually means avoid the weekends. Obviously, we, we avoid when the moon is up. Um, I know that Bill takes a lot of uh, flats and darks and things like that so he can subtract as much of the noise from his images that he can. Um, but we don't really use filters. We probably should. We certainly are in the best place that would, you know, you'd think would be able to take advantage of them. But we've, it's just never been an issue. Anyone else? I don't see any hands up and I don't see, um, oh, Andrew's back. There we go. Uh, yes, and uh, just one last one, because yep. I, um, I mean, I have not been getting out into the uh, countryside um, in away from the city very much these days. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when you do your sit up, do you do your sit up mostly on kind of uh, new moon nights or do you use any, do you kind of do other nights? Oh, all nights, um, even all full nights. moon. It's always a, a good idea to go out and practice things. Like I know that Bill, when he got the new camera, he was out there just setting things up to see how it would work. It didn't matter if the moon was in the sky or not. Um, and, and make sure that he could get the focus right. Um, if he's going to take some serious astrophotos, he will avoid the full moon. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, whenever that works out to be, that's when he's out in the shed. The nice thing about having the shed there is like you can, you can wake up at, at one o'clock in the morning and look out and say, oh, it's beautiful out there and none of the neighbor's lights are on, get dressed and run out mm -hmm. and start taking pictures right away because everything is already set up. And uh, uh, that's that's a huge benefit. Great. You don't do you, have to drive anywhere. I, I've got a similar type of backyard. Uh, do you have any problems with um, kids or uh, kind of uh, uh, people uh, intrigued by Family. your equipment? Uh, that no. Would, you know? 
that's what really shocks me. None of the neighbors have come running over and said, oh my God, you have a telescope. Can we look through it? Not a word. I, it's like, you know, they see us out there and they think we're weird or something. <laughs> well, we are. But, <laughs> and they and they just, you know, shut the curtains and go away. Um, no, we haven't had any issues like that at all. And we've also not had any vandalism, but the, the backyard is completely enclosed and the gate is locked. So I don't know if that's, you know, why, or the fact that there isn't really anything in there worth taking. I don't know. Yeah. Um, last uh, point uh, or comment. Uh, that's a beautiful shit. Nicely done. Um, I like your hockey pucks. That's fantastic. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Made in Canada solution. Yeah. Good engineering. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. John, back to you, I think. And I don't see any more questions. Do you? No, I think I think we're done here. Oh, no hang on, hang on, hang on. There is a question. Oh. Um, and did you need any permits or anything no. for the power to the shed? Okay, we did not need any permits. Um, as I said, the city of Hamilton bylaws state that you must any outbuildings must be less than 108 square feet. So we made the shed 100 square feet. The power is just an extension cord from the house. When we need it, it's there. So easy peasy. We kept it as simple as we could. Okay. Okay. I don't see any more questions in the chat no. and um, no indication that anyone has a question with their hand up. So um, thanks, Anne. John, we can turn it to you. Did we lose John? Do we lose everybody? Sue, can you yes. hear me? Yes, yes. I'm still here. It just came back on. We had got- I'm the here. I'm here. Okay. I'm All right. We're but having it power. Is, but it is a big storm here in Ancaster. Uh, in Hamilton too. Yeah. yeah, in Hamilton too. I think we might've lost John. Too. So um, I'll take over for now in place of him for the time being. Uh, Melissa, are you guys still there? Family Whitman, you're there? Hey. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess in the absence of, of John, because I can't, I can't find him. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Brian Whitman. And Brian is going to uh, share some information tonight on uh, solar observing. So again, if we can have everyone mute um, their video and their um, microphone, and Brian will turn it over to you. Just to know this is a video, so hopefully it will stream nice and smoothly tonight, um, but just be patient if it's a little bit jerky and the storm isn't going to help this. So Brian, it's over to you. Okay. Um... Well, I'm doing a little presentation on solar astronomy for beginners. It's pretty simple. I'm pretty sure all of you already probably know this, but uh, just thought I'd send something out. Uh, whoever's got the video, if you want to play it, that'd be great. Hi, my name is Brian. As astronomers, we tend to focus on the galaxies, nebula, and the moon, and other celestial objects in the night sky. But with this presentation, I'd like to explore the other sky we often ignore, the daytime sky. I'm going to give an introduction, but first, there's a few safety rules that I have to go over. Number one, never look directly at the sun without the proper equipment. This includes eclipse glasses and solar filters. Number two. Never look at the sun through your telescope or binoculars without a solar filter. Number three, 
never leave your telescope or binoculars pointed at the sun for too long. You could do some serious damage to your equipment. What you have to remember is you have a giant version of this. The sun might not seem very interesting. It doesn't have interesting craters or moving shadows, but that's not true. You can see transits where a planet crosses in front of the sun, sunspots, and even observe a solar eclipse. Let's begin. Solar telescopes and filters can be expensive, but you can still do some solar astronomy if you're careful. All you need is a telescope or binoculars and a flat, clean surface. I have used paper taped to the wall, white foam board, and even one time I used a pizza box. First, I'll start with the telescope. Because we can't use a finder scope because we can go blind, we have to use the shadow. So what I usually like to do is make sure that the shadow is pointed as small as it can go. So at this time, instead of pointing it at the sun, we're pointing it at the ground. Then I take my whiteboard, I find it, I put it in front, and I just kind of have to shimmy it around a little bit. There it is. You see it? There. There doesn't happen to be any sunspots today, but that doesn't make it not interesting. Now for the binoculars. With binoculars, you have to use three new equipment. One, the cap for this. This cardboard cutout that I did myself very elegantly to put on to create a shadow so that your observing surface is a little easier to see. And this piece of cardboard to observe the sun. Now, what we have to do first is put this on here. Should be an easy fix. You just gotta put that on just like that. Then you take your cap and you put it on. Now you're gonna do exactly the same thing like we did with the telescope with the shadow. Now, once you get that little orangey spot, tighten the tripod. Take your thing, your cardboard, focus your binoculars, hold it out to a distance, and there you go. You have the sun. Now again, there aren't any sunspots, but it's still a very cool accomplishment to see the sun without any solar filters. An astronomer's worst enemy is a cloudy sky, but that's not necessarily the end of solar viewing. If there's a thin layer of clouds, you can still see the sun. Here's a video of the sun I saw while clouds pass over. So that's a brief introduction to solar viewing, but that's not all there is to do. In the event horizon, so expertly put together by Bob Christmas, we see many wonderful pictures of the night sky, faraway galaxies, nebula, the moon, and more. But the daytime sky is a great source of pictures too. All you need is for fluffy clouds, some trees, and a well-timed sunset. Here are some pictures of the daytime sky I've been taking with my trusty simple point-and-shoot Nikon. Thank you for watching. I hope you have some fun observing the sun. Remember, it's hot. Okay, any questions? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for them to catch up. Yes, uh, I've just got one question. Oh, okay, what's up? With the uh, the filter, but where did you buy your filter for um, your uh, telescope? I don't actually have one. That is an image from the internet. Oh, okay. Um, 
the the one that, that you put on uh did you not have a silver reflective uh type filter that would no that's on? the cap that you put on a binocular to keep oh, okay. it from dust all right that was really good i like your idea with the um the uh let's see uh binoculars um i've got several pairs and um um, I'm always looking for ways to uh, um, view uh, the sun with uh, a telescope, but I never thought of binoculars. I will use that. That's great. Thank you. Very welcome. Anybody else? We have a, oh, Jim? Uh, yeah, uh, Sue, uh, I just got a phone call from, from John. Uh, I'm sitting outside again. Um, his internet has gone down, so he's not with us at, the, at this time. And uh, we can just kind of see if we can carry on without him. We can. We will carry on without him. Thanks for letting me know. I, I figured that might might be the case. Um, Brian, there's a neat comment here from um, Chris Cheatley. Don't forget the sunscreen. Ah, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> um, and there's a question from Joanne. Uh, she says, I love the binocular idea too. Does it matter what power the binocular is? Um, I depends on the sunspot or transit or whatever you're trying to view. Um, 10 by 50s should be able to get you a sunspot, but they're pretty tiny. I'm using 12 by 60s right now, so they should be doing pretty good. So, yeah. And she would also like to know, how long can you leave your binoculars out in the sun? My golden rule is leave it pointing at the sun no more than 10 seconds. Okay. And um, Doug has a question for you. Did you have any problems getting the focus on either the telescope or the binos? No. What I did was when I couldn't focus it on the telescope or binoculars, I would just move the cardboard in and out. Okay to zoom it in or make it smaller. And Doug Curry gives you a good improvising with the binoculars comment. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, um, what are your future sun goals? Oh, I don't know. A nice eclipse would be cool. And Bob said, thanks for the plug. Very welcome. If that is um, all of the questions for Brian, and I don't see any hands up, I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, as, as you heard, Jim came in and said that, that John's internet has gone down, so he will not be um, joining us anytime soon unless it comes up quickly again for him. So we're just going to kind of continue here. I want to thank Brian very much for putting um, the video together and to uh, all of his um, assistants in the background um, who gave him some assistance with the video as well. So thank you to everybody for putting that back. Great info, Brian. Thank you very much for sharing. That was awesome. Yeah, definitely two thumbs up. Well, well done. Um, at this point in time, um, our final presenter this evening is Matthew with the sky this month. So Matt, if you would like to take over, the screen is all yours. Okay, thanks. I'll just uh, do the share screen. Maybe. Zoom. Hang on. We're getting there. There we go. Can you hear me okay, Sue? Sue? Yes, I was just you muted. Yep, you're you're fine. And we okay. see you, we see your screen. And I think you're good to go. Okay. So welcome to the sky this month for July, 2020. A lot of what I've got to present tonight is actually stuff that's already happened, but quite a bit has happened in the last month and is happening still. So let's get going. Uh, as most of you know, there's a really nice comet in the morning sky right now, comet Neowise. And uh, the first image I got of somebody from the club 
was from Ann and Bill taken on at 430 in the morning on the 5th. And it's a really nice picture done in looks like early daytime. And uh, at that point, it's really hard to get any kind of image. So that was a really good shot. And uh, let's see what else we have. So this image is from John Govro around the same day, maybe a day later. And just so as you know, the comet nomenclature is, um, the C is for comets that are not periodic. So if the orbit's longer than 200 years, it's a C. If it's a P, it's less than 200 years. This comet has an orbit of about 7,100 years. So it's most definitely a C. Of course, the year. And then F3 is the last half of March and it's the third comet in that time frame. So the first uh, half of January is A, the second half B, February first half is C, and so on. And NEOWISE is a repurposed uh, telescope that's searching for near-Earth objects in space, and uh, it was what found this. So was that just yesterday, Janice? Yeah, just yesterday at uh, four in the morning, we met some of us at that um, um, Sam Lawrence Park and uh, yeah, at four o'clock and Chris managed to get this picture of the comet over the city and over the lake there. There was an awful lot of moisture in the air, a lot of reflected light bouncing all over the place. So not the best conditions, but it did become naked eye quite easily and look great in binoculars. This is uh, my wife, Janice, this is her images. The, um, the comet in the, the the daylight picture is right there. I'm circling it with the uh, cursor. And the image on the left she took with her 400 mil lens and uh, it came out quite well. So uh, my pictures were no better. So I didn't include any of that at all, but I got a nice picture of the sunrise. So I included that instead. And uh, we did stick around till about seven o'clock. So we got to see, um, we got to see a really nice sunrise. However, even after the sun came up, there was still a ton of moisture in the air. And this is a view I turned into black and white to make it a bit more easy to see the tower, but that's as much as we could see of Toronto. Uh, and even then I brought it out a bit more just to, to make the skyline a bit more obvious, but the conditions were not the best. Uh, Carrie Ann Lucky Hepburn, who works for the Weather Network, she's uh, a club member most of the time. And uh, she stacked about 25 images, I think, of one minute each to get this. And uh, it's a beautiful picture. Um, I didn't try any stacking. Uh, next time I'm going to try it. Uh, this is not a club member, but I really like the picture taken from it looks like Toronto Island, I guess. And a uh, nice shot of the comet. And here's a guy from Arches National Park. He was. Uh, he went there to try and get a picture of the comet at dawn and he walked around this arch until he found the right angle and got the picture. So I guess he was uh, not too afraid of rattlesnakes, tarantulas or anything like that. And uh, he got a great shot. So I thought I'd include that one too. Alan Dyer is an astronomer, he's Canadian. Uh, he was the editor, I think of Sky News for a long time or one of the assistant editors. And uh, he lives in Alberta and uh, he gets consistently amazing images of all sorts of astronomical events. And this one here is of course the comet. So over the next week from uh, tomorrow on for, to the 17th, this is sort of the path of the comet through the sky at about quarter to five in the morning. And as you can see, Capella and Origa are up in the top right here. And you can see that if you come straight down from Compella, about two thirds of the way to the horizon or just over half, and just start looking at for it on that uh, path there, depending on what day it is. And it will really be quite apparent once you get your binoculars on it. Uh, this is how we saw it or how you will see it tomorrow morning, actually, if it's not raining. Uh, this happens to be the ISS. So at 431, 432, the ISS will be passing through the field. Comet Neowise is down here near the horizon. And over here, you've got the Pleiades and uh, the constellation Taurus, planet Venus, very close to Aldebaran. And I mention Aldebaran because 
uh, as a sidebar, I was watching the Formula One race the other day and I saw this new team called Alpha Tori. Well, it turns out it's not a new team. It was Toro Rosso, which is like the junior team to Red Bull. And they renamed it to Alpha Tori and came out with an extremely expensive line of clothing, which probably none of us care about. But they picked Alpha Tori because it's the red eye of the bull. And that's, so that's their new name. So I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, over the next month to the rest of this month, starting around the 15th to be, um, to be, this word? Reasonable. It's, you're gonna have to wait to the 15th to look for it in the morning. It's gonna be in the north, northwest, and it's gonna work its way higher in the sky towards the west over the rest of the month. And it should be great because it's a, a lot better to look at it in the evening than at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. Now at the end of the month here, it's entering Coma Bernices and this is an area rich in galaxies. And I think it's just the third or fourth of August, it's gonna be passing right about here, NGC 4565, which is a large edge on spiral galaxy. And uh, it's only gonna be half a degree away so if anybody can get a shot of that, I think it will still be a really nice shot to get. Now, Alan Dyer, uh, there's a few of his pictures in this presentation. This one is really to show the noctilucent clouds, which I talked about in, I think it was February. Uh, they have been all over the night sky in the northern latitudes, although a few times been all the way down as far as California. So. He was taking pictures of these noctilucent clouds and they form about 85 kilometers up in the mesosphere. And they, they really are just ice crystals that form around comet meteor dust or smoke. And uh, they require extremely cold temperatures to form. And this year we've had consistently extremely cold temperatures. So these clouds have been around since basically the beginning of the year and they're pretty amazing. The other thing is in this, picture, which if you had the full sized image is huge, you can see he's marked the Big Dipper, Polaris, Capella, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, the full moon and Altair, all within a, a very wide angle field of view. And uh, yesterday morning, actually, we saw something similar ourselves just looking right across the sky. It was very nice. Now, here's some noctilucent clouds in London, England. That's, of course, the London Eye. On the right, so the picture is probably taken from Westminster Bridge. Now, this guy deserves a medal. He woke up in the middle of the night and he saw these clouds and he jumped on his bicycle and he started riding around London, uh, trying to photograph as many of the big, you know, monuments and stuff as he could. And uh, apparently, he was looking up too much instead of down, and he ended up wiping out his bicycle. I ended up in hospital for a while, so uh, I give him a for effort and uh, maybe he needs a pair of glasses. I don't know. Uh, this is not a club member, but it's just a beautiful shot from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, back in June. And here's one from Budapest, Hungary, July 5th. Again, it's spectacular. These are electric blue clouds, and I really, really like them. And then, of course, you can combine the comet and the noctilucent clouds. So here's Alan Dyer again, and he's got Capella and Comet Neowise right in the edge of the uh, the clouds at the horizon there, the Pleiades, Venus, and he got the ISS. So the ISS has been, uh, been um, sneaking into a lot of the pictures lately. And here's another one that Alan took, which I think is spectacular. And here's an actual video a fellow took. I don't know who he is, but he's on space weather and he got the noctilucent clouds uh, sort of moving along and did a time lapse with the comet in behind them. It's beautiful. So let's go back into June for the Venus occultation. It took place during daylight hours. Unfortunately, by the time we could see it in Ontario, it had already passed and the moon had moved beyond Venus. So we missed the whole show. But in France, it was optimal. And uh, this fellow here, Didier, he um, caught Venus just as it was about to go behind the limb of the moon. So that was kind of cool. And now this fella, Thierry Legault, he's one of the best 
uh, astrophotographers in the world, especially when it comes to shooting the space station. And he drove a thousand kilometers in, to, into Italy to get this shot of the space station transiting the picture with Venus and the moon as well in the same image. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Two days later was the annular solar eclipse that took place over Asia and the Pacific. And this is the one picture I actually have that I decided was worth showing. It's a beautiful picture. It shows the ring around the moon and it that lets you know the rings there that's annular that the moon is quite far away from the earth and it's not big enough to cover the sun entirely. And the location was something called Lake Manasarova in Tibet. So where the heck is that? Well, here's Nepal here. And this location with this funny little symbol is where the lake is. There's India down here. So this is way up in the Himalayas uh, on the side of the uh, Tibet Plateau. So you can see that the lake is at 15,000 feet. And there's a picture of the lake. It's stark, but it's really quite beautiful. And it's where four different religions go. It's a, a very special uh, place in their religions. And they, they, do, um, uh, they go on pilgrimages to go to see it. And it got me to wondering, if that's at 15,000 feet, what's the highest permanent settlement in the world? Well, apparently it's in the Andes Mountain in La Rinconada. La Rinconada, there you go in Peru. And this community is at 16,728 feet above sea level. And I don't think it's somewhere I want to go because it's very ramshackle. In 2000, there was almost nobody there. And in a period of eight years, 30,000 people moved in because they discovered gold in their hills. So they've got electricity, but they don't have any indoor plumbing. So I don't imagine it's a very nice place to visit. But it is an interesting story if anybody wants to look it up. Here's a different view of the eclipse. From the right side, you can see the terminator of the, Earth, of the uh, Earth. And on the left side, you can see the black round blob of the moon shadow racing across Asia and into the Pacific until it meets the terminator. And back to Thierry Legault. So over a period of a couple of days, he took some really interesting pictures. This one is of the ISS transiting the sun, and he images it um, a lot. He's always looking for this type of picture, but as you can see, he actually caught the Crew Dragon space capsule attached to the space station. So I thought that was kind of neat, but the next one's even neater. The next day, he imaged it again, and this time he caught the Canadarm in the image. And it's the first time that the Canadarm's ever been imaged uh, as the um, space station races across the sun. The only other time it's been imaged was again Thierry, and he imaged it with a space, uh, an astronaut doing a spacewalk at the end of the arm. And you could actually see the astronaut, which is truly amazing. So to get these images, he's got an eight inch Apo refractor, and he, his images are at 132 thousandths of a second. And when you shoot that fast, even as something as thin as the Canadarm, in the, it, while he's shooting the image at that, at that rate, the Canadarm, the whole unit, the, is only moving about half the width of the Canadarm. So when you shoot that fast, you don't get any blur, and the Canadarm comes out quite nicely. And he has a special rig set up with all kinds of RAM in it, <coughs> excuse me, so that he can um, capture loads and loads of images and then you know, take his time downloading them from the RAM. This is his telescope. I looked it up because uh, I had a feeling it was probably quite nice and actually it is. So I looked up the price and over here with the tax, it'd be about $35,000 for that telescope. And it weighs about 23 kilos. So it is a big honking refractor and I imagine spectacular to look through. And my last uh, slide here is of a video I took of the moon back in June. I was just mucking around with my Mallinckam Micro. It's a very small little video camera, 640 by 480. It's it's very basic tech, but I put it on the moon and so I, to test and got this image. The shimmering is, of course, the atmosphere. 
and I was just testing to see if I could actually get the rig working. I've had it for years, but just never really bothered with it too much. And uh, I thought it was worth a go. So this is part of a video that I got at that time. Not the easiest unit to use because all the buttons are about two millimeters across and are on the back of this very, very small camera. So manipulating the menus is a real pain actually, but it only costs 200 bucks. So you get what you pay for. And I believe that that is the end. Thank you. Chat. What do I do now? I don't know if if John is back with us right now. John, oh, I'm, I'm, John I'm, is back. Oh, I'm John back on back. audio. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out. I'm back on audio, although I think it says that the host has disabled my video. Can you I hear? will. I will fix that. Uh, that's quite all right. So. And uh, while uh, while Sue is is getting me back there, uh, thank you uh, to Sue for uh, for for jumping in there and and handling things. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you to Matt for that uh, uh, excellent presentation, and I think I owe a thank you to Brian, uh, whose presentation I I unfortunately missed, uh, but I uh, fortunately I had already seen it beforehand. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, delighted that uh, uh, that you were all able to enjoy it, uh, enjoy it as well. Thank you all. Uh, I'm sorry I, I didn't mean to step away there. Uh, we were in the middle of the storm. There was a bit of lightning, one huge, tremendous crack, and everything just went dark. And that was the end of me. Anyway, so I'm now on my wife's phone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there she is, yay, uh, it, uh, on my wife's phone, uh, able to rejoin you again. Uh, so a big thank you to everyone. Is uh, So have I missed it all? Is there anything else left before we're done? There are some questions. So we'll start with Family Whitman. I just want to thank uh, Doug and Sue. When we did the video and we had a test run, we had a little bit of problem with it. So we kind of back and forth and, and they worked on fixing it and, and Doug did a whole, I don't even know, but he made it work. So I just wanted to put a shout out to them too. I, I very much appreciated their help with all of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have a question from Andrew B to Matthew. Is Neowise predicted to get significantly dimmer as it becomes visible in the evening sky? Yes, it's going to get dimmer by the end of the month because it's uh, be moving away from us again in its orbit. Um, so I don't know what magnitude they're expecting at the end of the month. But uh, right now it's about magnitude one to two at the core. And uh, I would expect by the end of July, I mean, I'm guessing, but I would say mag eight by the time we get to that point. Do we have any other questions for Matthew? Anne said she really um, thought it was an awesome collection of images. Thanks. Thanks to everybody who uh, sent them in. There is a question, Matthew, um, or to everyone, I guess. How much has everyone heard that a new study mentioned six additional candidate exomoons have been found from the Kepler data? And what do you think of this? This is from Douglas to Douglas Curry to everybody. So if people want to reply in the chat, they can reply there. Or Matthew or John, you could to either of you could reply now. I haven't heard oh. about them myself. I haven't heard much about this new one either. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, when I uh, uh, just, just and, and this is going to, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to feel terribly old for having said it. Uh, but when I first started teaching astronomy uh, uh, college classes, uh, there had not been a single exoplanet that had ever been discovered. It was purely speculative at that point. And I can remember saying that, of course, we assume that there are other planets and that out there going around other stars. And now here it is, and the list of confirmed planets is in the thousands, thousands of them. 
of confirmed exoplanets, planets going around other stars. And, and that's absolutely uh, mind boggling, you know, that, uh, that we have seen that in, in, in our lifetime. What an extraordinary uh, 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 time to be involved in this field and see stuff like that happen. Anything else, Sue? I don't see any other questions in the chat or anyone else who has turned their mic or camera on to speak at this point in time. So, um, John, I think you can wrap it up. Wonderful. I'm in time to say goodbye to everyone. So a big yeah. thank you to uh, 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 to Anne uh, for for that uh, wonderful uh, tour of her observatory. Um, uh, that was great. Please thank Bill. And it was wonderful seeing tiny little young Alex there in one of the pictures when the observatory was being built. That was a great presentation. Uh, thank you to the entire family Whitman and to Brian uh, for that. Uh, uh, I had a nice introduction for you, Brian, that I didn't get to do, but I'm so glad everybody got to see that presentation. Thank you to Brian for doing that. Thank you to Matthew, uh, a, a cornerstone uh, of the club. Always love your presentations, wonderful. And again, to the behind the scenes people, uh, Sue and Doug and Chris for making all of this happen. Uh, just wonderful. And thank you to everyone who joined in this month, uh, was able to join us. A pleasure. Uh, I look forward to the next time when we can all do this again. So thanks very much. And we'll see you again soon.